When we read through the passion story from any of the Gospels, it's a story of ups and downs, it's a story of highs and lows, it's a story of joy, and a story of sorrow. Today is Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday was a very much of a high. It was a day of joy, a day of excitement. It's a day when there were big hopes and dreams and the hope that these big dreams were finally going to be fulfilled. I can just imagine uh, there, the Jerusalem at that time of year, there were lots of people coming into Jerusalem because it was a time of Passover. And uh, so there would have been lots of crowds. And when you think about what it must have looked like on that day, as, as Jesus, there he, there he is, riding on a donkey. And as, as the crowd grows around, and, and the ones that are waiting and longing for this king to come and to set them free so that they can, be, they, they can live as God has promised. And so it was a day of much joy and anticipation and excitement. But the, the joy and the thrill of Palm Sunday turns into a low, turns into confusion and heartbreak as the week progresses. Throughout the week, Jesus clears the temple of corrupt buying and selling practices. He turns over the tables that where the money changers are working. He makes a real mess. You can just imagine the money rolling all over the place, people trying to grab it. From what, what uh, the way I understand, there were, would have been animals there as well, and, and uh, it would have been a, quite, a, quite a scene. He disrupts the worship service that would be trying to go on. Through the week, the religious leaders try to trap him again with questions so that they can arrest him. Through the week, Jesus tells the disciples what's going to happen to Jerusalem and about the destruction of the temple. Later in the week, he's anointed with oil by a woman at a dinner party. Then Thursday evening, he eats that last meal, the Passover meal, with his disciples. And at the beginning of that meal, he gets down on his knees in front of each one of them and washes their feet. After supper, he spends time praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying for courage and strength to go through the ordeal of what is coming. And then a company of Roman soldiers arrive to arrest him, sent by Jewish religious leaders, led by one of his disciples, Judas. Peter denies ever knowing Jesus. And in less, in less than a week, the cries of Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, it changes to away with him, crucify him. And you have these words of hope and joy and expectation turning into jeers and mocking deep disappointment, and eventually death. All of those that were around that day, that Palm Sunday, were the ones that were hoping that he's the one they're waiting for, hoping that he's the Messiah. And they're deeply confused and disappointed. We thought he was the one. We thought he was the one. Meanwhile, Jesus goes through this work this week with determination. Despite what people say or what they think, or what they expect. He knows what, what awaits him, and yet he unwaveringly follows that path set before him. And all through his ministry, and even at this time of his life, people have to wrestle with the question, who is this man? Is he just another religious zealot who will fade away and be, be uh, forgotten? Or is he the one? Is he God's Messiah? A lot of them think that he is, but it doesn't make sense because he isn't doing what they think that he should be doing. When Jesus calmed the storm a year or so earlier, the disciples ask, who is this man? Two different times Jesus heals lame men, and both times the religious leaders ask, who is this man? At the dinner party, when the, the uh, sinful woman anoints Jesus' feet with oil, the guests ask, who is this who even forgives sins? And on Palm Sunday, when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem on the donkey, the whole city is shaken. And the people ask, who is this? Who is this man? At his trial, Jesus is asked by the high priest, 
Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And later Pilate will ask, Are you the King of the Jews? Who are you? Jesus is not what they expected. And yet his message draws people in. And his miracles and his teaching and his healing seem to show that he might be from God. He should be from God with everything he's doing. Who is this man? There's two things I want to look at this morning as we look at the passion story. First, Jesus addresses who he is and what he came to do at his trial and crucifixion. The religious council asked him point blank, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus replies, you are right in saying that I am. And that's Luke 22:70. And Pilate asks, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, yes, it is as you say. Yes, Jesus is God's son. He is the Messiah. He is king. And all four of the gospel writers try to keep that front and center before us as we read through this account. When the soldiers dress Jesus in purple robes and they place that crown of thorns on his head and they bow down before him, they're mocking him, they're ridiculing him, but in reality, they're crowning him as king. Jesus dies in place of another criminal, Barabbas. We have the picture of the innocent one who dies for the guilty one. The gospel writers give witness to how Jesus offers love and forgiveness to those crucifying him instead of striking back in retaliation. And it makes me think right now of how when Jesus was told, you could call legions of angels to help you. They were right, but he didn't. The gospel writers report how Pilate posts a sign above the cross with Jesus' crime on it. This is his crime. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. They recount how Jesus forgives a criminal, a thief who is crucified beside him, and promises him that today, this very sinful, now forgiven man will be with him in paradise. Who is this man? Jesus is the perfect man, the perfect Israelite, doing what Israel and what we couldn't do ourselves. And he takes our sins, our guilt, our shame on his body, and he defeats the power of sin, the power of evil, the power of Satan. And as Jesus is lifted up on the cross, it's his exaltation, it's his glorification as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, is God's son, the Messiah. He tells them who he is and what he came to do, and he says, yes, this is who I am. Second, Jesus talks about his kingdom. He tells Pilate, my kingdom isn't of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place, and that's found in John 18:36. Jesus goes on to say that the reason he was born, the reason he, came to com the reason he came into the world, is to testify to the truth. I've always wondered exactly what that means. He came to testify to the truth. We've been talking about the kingdom of God over the last numbers of weeks. God's kingdom is this upside-down kingdom. It isn't like this world. It doesn't come from this world. But his kingdom comes for this world. And it's a very different kingdom than the ways of our world. God's kingdom clashes with the worldview, the way of doing things of our world. Jesus' followers expect him to march on Jerusalem and do whatever it takes to complete what they felt that he started. And Jesus does, only he does it different. The truth is, God's kingdom comes through Jesus' nonviolent journey to the cross. God's kingdom comes as Jesus turns the other cheek and doesn't retaliate. But in fact, when one of his soldier, one of his disciples goes crazy with a sword and cuts off the ear of one of the servants of the soldiers, Jesus heals that ear. The truth is that Jesus comes and takes the place of Barabbas, the outlaw. The truth of the kingdom 
the kingdom is, is accomplished as an innocent one dies in the place of the guilty. That's the truth that Jesus came to testify to. He announced and inaugurated the kingdom of God during his life. And now, as he is crucified on this cross, and as he dies, he implements the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is defined by the cross, and it's here now. And it's a kingdom that is not by violence. Jesus says, as he's lifted up on the cross, that he will draw all people to himself. And it's a kingdom of love, a kingdom of forgiveness and justice and peace. It's a kingdom of humbly serving and loving one another and confronting evil with good as Jesus did. Through Jesus the Messiah, God reclaims his sovereign rule over our world. And we're invited to be part of God's love story, shown first in Jesus, and then we see it as we continue to read into Acts, we see it by Jesus' followers as they live in the power of the Holy Spirit, what Jesus taught and what he came to bring. We're invited to repent, to change direction, and join this kingdom movement and live God's kingdom ways right now until the kingdom comes in all of its fullness, in power and glory someday. And we're invited to actually pray these radical words, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we're invited to live that way right now. I love the story that Marion read this morning. We get a glimpse of this happening even before Jesus' resurrection. The last three hours of Jesus' life were told that darkness settles in and covers over the land. As Jesus draws his last breath, he takes into his death the sin of the world. My sin, your sin. And when that happens, the first thing that happens is that nature reacts. The natural world reacts. We hear that there's an earthquake. The rocks split apart. The earth shakes. And we're heard, we hear that the temple curtain is torn from top to bottom. Second, we have the centurion. The centurion has been standing there at the foot of the cross, watching and hearing what's all going on. He's felt that earthquake. He's heard Jesus cry. He's seen how Jesus died. And we're told that Jesus died much, much sooner than what was expected. And after saying, seeing all of this, the centurion says, surely this man was the son of God. The centurion is not a religious leader. He's not a loyal disciple. But he's a Gentile. He's a battle-hardened Roman centurion, a soldier. And this is the one who identifies Jesus for who he is. This man is the Son of God. Even as Jesus dies. When I read this this time, it really surprised me and even shocked me. He says this as Jesus died. The disciples know that you can't have a crucified, a dead Messiah. The centurion identifies Jesus as God's son, even as he dies before resurrection. And I believe his words send a signal to the whole world that the kingdom has indeed come. That God's doing something new. And out of the darkness, something new is being born. And it's going to affect not just people, but the whole universe. And again, reflect back. Go back and read those verses in Romans, Romans chapter 8. On Palm Sunday, the crowds shout, Hosanna! Hosanna means help or save. Save us now! They want a savior to come with military power to overthrow the Romans and establish, reestablish the throne of David. But that's not the kind of savior that God sent. God saves not through military power, but by a radical reorientation of our hearts. God saves not by destroying those who oppose him, but by forgiving those who nail his son to the cross. God saves not by escaping death, but by going into death and through death with us all the way to the grave. That is our hope when our loved ones die, that Jesus is there. 
The religious leaders laugh at the joke that they, said, they say, Jesus came to save others, but he can't even save himself. And they don't realize that the joke is on them. It's because Jesus refused to save himself that he saves others. Surely this man is the Son of God, Jesus, our Lord, our King, our Savior. Who is this man? I encourage all of us to think about that. Who is this man? Who is this man? Who is this Jesus to me, to each of us, and to grapple with that question? And I hope that we have each made that decision and that we will submit ourselves as well to Jesus, to his way of life. And as we do, it will also change our lives as it did those followers of Jesus back in his day. Let's pray together. God of the foolish cross, coming down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey, you're not the savior that they expected. And when we really grapple with what you did and who you are, you're not the savior we would expect either. Your power doesn't look like the power we want our God to demonstrate. Your wisdom makes no sense to us. We're happy to join the crowd waving branches, but not so sure we want to follow you into the temple courts, into the upper room, into the Garden of Gethsemane, to the foot of the cross. Forgive our false assumptions. Clarify our clouded vision. And let us relax into the foolishness of your love and your grace. Father, even when things don't make sense to us, help us to set our hearts and our minds steadfastly to walk in the ways of Jesus Christ. Help us to live into that new creation, into the kingdom of God. And Lord, I just pray that as we look at your word throughout the week, as we gather together, that you will continue to challenge us, challenge us and, and bring us up short even when we, with what we read. Stir in our hearts, O oh God, again. Thanksgiving for what you have done and joy and excitement of who you have called us to be because of who you are. Thank you, O oh God, for Jesus. Lord, I thank you that because of Jesus, we can stand forgiven. Sin and shame, despair, that you welcome us in. I just thank you and praise you, O oh God. You are so good. You are so good. Lord, as we head out this week, I thank you that you go with us. I just pray that we may have opportunities to share the goodness and the greatness of Jesus Christ. Lord, as we go through this week, may we be reminded of what was happening this week back 2,000 years ago. And as we gather on Good Friday and then Easter Sunday, pray you just prepare our hearts. May we be even more thankful, more full of joy because of what you have done for us and for who you are. Bless each one, I pray, that we may be a blessing to others in Jesus' name. Amen.